time, brethren. It is truly great to see everyone who's here this morning. You know, in a day that is growing increasingly more secular, more sensual, it's so good to see those who have put their approval this morning on that which is spiritual in nature. The Bible tells us in Philippians 1 and verse 10 that we are to approve those things that are excellent. And there's nothing more excellent than meeting on the first day of the week with those of like precious faith for one reason, to proclaim the excellencies of our God, to exalt Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior. So we do commend you for being here this morning. We would encourage you to come back this evening at five o'clock. This morning we're going to continue our study from the book of Psalms, and tonight we're going to conclude that series. Now remember, originally we entitled it 10 Reasons Why Psalms is So Loved. But we'll probably have to be talking about 10 plus reasons. Because we added one that originally I wasn't planning on looking at last week for Father's Day. We, we put in that one about because of the counsel it gives. And specifically, we talked mainly to fathers and our responsibility. So we've said this, a diligent study of the book of Psalms will evoke faith, produce awe, inspire confidence, but most of all, result in a sincere love from a pure heart. Now this is what every one of the 66 books of the Bible will do. Psalms is no exception. But I think as you look at these, evoke faith, produce awe, inspire confidence, result in a sincere love from a pure heart, certainly, certainly we can apply that to the book of Psalms. Look what we've done. Ten plus reasons why Psalms is so loved. These are the ones we've looked at already. Number one through five, we've considered these because of the God it reveals because of the love it records, because of the praise it proclaims, because of the reverence it presents, because of the counsel it provides. Now, if you were listening to our brother Tim's song selection, a lot of what he sang this morning and let us in was, was Father, Father of Mercies. And other songs like that, speaking of his mercy, his care, his concern, his comfort. And that leads us beautifully into this next point. Because of the comfort it affords. The book of Psalms is so unique in this aspect. I don't know about you, but when I need a spiritual pick-me-up, when I need to be encouraged, there are several verses that I go to but this book right here, the book of Psalms, is guaranteed, is guaranteed to offer you, to offer me comfort. And not just offer it, it will provide that comfort. You remember in 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 3, Paul says concerning God, he's the father of mercies. He's the God of all comfort. And the book of Psalms sort of puts the spotlight on our God, the God of all comfort, and explains that comfort, speaks to us concerning that comfort, shows us that, yes, this comfort does come from our God. The scripture that was read this morning, Stephen read Psalm 23. That's a psalm of comfort. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. David's talking about comfort. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Again, it's all about comfort. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the ultimate comfort. And so, why is the book of Psalms so loved? Well, because of the comfort it affords. 
Let's just mention a few verses in connection with comfort that you'll find in the book of Psalms. I would encourage you to write these down. Look at these later. Add to these verses. Notice in Psalm 119 and verse 50. Listen to what this verse says. This is my comfort in my affliction, for your word has given me life. Notice that this is my comfort in my affliction. Your word has given me life. Your word has comforted me. Now what's interesting in that verse, it talks about two things. It talks about affliction, but not only affliction. God offsets that affliction with his comfort. You know, this world is full of conflict. It's full of confusion. But our God is full of comfort. And so in our affliction, God comforts us. You know, sometimes we have this view of Christianity that's not biblical. That if I will become a Christian, I won't have any more problems. I'm not going to experience sorrow. Everything's going to be that proverbial bed of roses. The Bible does not teach that. Jesus said in this world, you will have tribulation. Now here's the key for the Christian. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You see, in my affliction, in your affliction, in our sorrow, what's different between those still in the world and the child of God is that we have our God, the God of all comfort. And he's going to comfort me in that affliction. Listen to another verse. This one, you can't hardly beat it for beauty. Notice in Psalm 71 and verse 21, you shall increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. There it is, comfort me on every side. Wherever I turn, wherever I am, whatever is happening to me. Now again, remember the psalmist has already talked about affliction. He's not saying comfort on every side. It means I'll have no problems. I'll have no sorrow, no heartache, no affliction, no pain. No, in the midst of that affliction, God says, I'll comfort you on every side. Look at another verse. In Psalm 119 and verse 76, the psalmist says, let I pray. Your merciful kindness be for my comfort. That's where we find the comfort. It's in our God. It's based, upon, it's based upon his nature. His merciful kindness. That's where my comfort is coming from. This world can't offer that. But God freely gives it. And then listen to one more verse. Notice this one. I found this one to be so very unique. It goes with the verse we've already talked about where the psalmist reveals affliction in this life. But listen to this. In Psalm 94, verse 19, it says, In the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comforts delight my soul. Notice that. In the multitudes of my anxieties within me. Are we not as humans filled at times with these anxieties within us. My anxieties, the psalmist says, but he goes on to say, your comforts. So yes, my anxieties, but Father, I'm so thankful for your comfort. Your comfort delights my soul. In the midst of my affliction, there's comfort. In the midst of my anxieties, there's comfort. That's why the book of Psalms is read so often. That's why the book of Psalms, many try to put verses to memory because these truths can comfort our souls in the midst of problems, in the midst of affliction, in the midst of anxieties. You remember in Isaiah 40 and verse one, 
Isaiah is told in that context by his God, remember, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, he says, comfort, oh comfort my people. Speak kindly to Jerusalem. So God wants his people to be comforted. And we can be. We will be. We shall be. If and only when we go to the book of Psalms and just read it. So because of the comfort it affords, look at number seven, because of the help it offers. There's a verse that we used last Sunday morning, and we talked about fathers and, of course, the fatherless. And we were talking about the help that we can find. Listen to this again in Psalm 10 and verse 14. Psalm 10 and verse 14, the helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Now, that term fatherless appears in that verse as for those who have no one to turn to. The, these are orphans and they don't have anyone to provide for them. They don't have anyone to care for them. They don't have anyone watching over them. But they do. They do. That's what this verse is saying. Again, the helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. You know, Hebrew parallelism is found in that verse. The helpless, the fatherless. That, that's what those terms are expressing. But the helpless commit themselves to God. Why? Because he is the helper. We're helpless. He's the helper of the fatherless. He's the helper of the helpless. That's another reason why Psalms is, is so loved, because of the help it offers. Consider another verse. Psalm 46 and verse 1. Very familiar verse. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. That's what God is. Here we are, we're helpless, but God is our refuge. God is our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Go back to the last point, that comfort, and remember in that affliction, and remember in our anxieties, we have help. We have comfort. Think about this. In Psalm 60 and verse 1, Listen to what the psalmist is pleading for, praying for. Give us help from trouble, for the help of man is useless. How many times have you found that out? We, we need help, we solicit help, and, and, and no one steps forth. Israel of old, she found that out so many times in the Old Testament. She would make an alliance with Egypt, with Assyria, with Babylon, with foreign nations. And once again, those nations proved to be of no help. God was their help. He always has been. He always will be. The help of man is useless. But contrast that with this verse. In Psalm 121, Verses 1 and 2, I will lift up my eyes to the hills, from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. Notice that this is where my help comes from. The next verse, notice the psalmist is speaking for himself in Psalm 121. But now in Psalm 124 and verse 8, notice this, now that my help becomes plural. And notice this, our help, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Do you see the contrast? What has the psalmist said about the help of man? It's useless. But the help of God, the help of the one who made heaven and earth, can you imagine that? He can do anything. He can do everything. And that's why, once again, the psalmist is boasting. My help is from the Lord 
who made heaven and earth. Our help is from the Lord who made heaven and earth. The point is, if he can make heaven and earth, and he did, then he can certainly help me. That's a small job for him if he's already created all things. Think about this next verse. Psalm 146 and verse 5. This is only the first part of it. But notice how it begins. Happy. Emphasize that. Underscore that. It says, Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help. Oh yes, happy. Immensely happy. Exceedingly happy. Why? Because I have, for my help, the one who made the heavens, the one who made the earth. I can't ask for a better helper. You can't ask for a better helper. And we'll never find a better helper. A last verse on this point here. In Psalm 94 and verse 17, notice what the psalmist says here. Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul would soon have settled in silence. If I did not have the Lord, unless he had been my help, my soul would have settled in silence. Remember, in Psalms, we see, as we've already noted, a lot of affliction. We see a lot of anxieties. But we also read about a lot of comfort. Why? Because God is the psalmist helper. He is his help, the very one who made the heaven and the earth. One last point this morning. Notice this. Because of the trust it inspires. You read through the book of Psalms and you're going to be motivated. Motivated to put your faith, your trust, your confidence in God. And I want to read a verse and I want to emphasize something that is very important. You know, I'll be honest with you. I've overlooked this simple application for a long, long time. But here's how simple it is. In Psalm 16 and verse 1, the psalmist says, Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. Now remember that. Preserve me, O God. Why? For in you I put my trust. Last week we mentioned Psalm 20 and verse 7. Remember those who trust in chariots and in horses. Or Psalm 44 and verse 6, those who trust in the bow. Or Psalm 52 and verse 7, that wicked man who trusts in the abundance of his riches. Now listen to this. My trust, your trust, anybody's trust is going to be where they put it. Example, at home sometimes I'll say, Julie, where are my keys? Julie's response, it's sort of identical to my response when she says the same thing to me. Your keys are exactly where you put them. <laughs> That's where they are. My keys are like my trust. You know where my trust is going to be found? Wherever I put it. And that's what the psalmist is saying. Psalm 16 and verse 1 again, Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. I don't put my trust in chariots. I don't put it in horses. I don't put my trust in bows. I don't put my trust in the abundance of riches. Your trust is going to be wherever you put it, wherever you place it. And there's no other place to put it except in God. And we see this over and over in the book of Psalms. Because of the trust it inspires. Our God is trustworthy. Our God is faithful. You can place your confidence in Him. You'll never be ashamed. Listen to another verse. Psalm 37 and verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. What a simple sentence. What a great exhortation. Trust in the Lord and do good. Can we give anything more concise than that? No. Put your confidence in the Lord and do what's right. 
Trust in the Lord and do good. Two verses later in, in Psalm 37 and verse 5, commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him. So commit your life to him, trust in him. I want you to turn with me to Psalm 37 because I want us to read one verse at the close of Psalm 37. Look at this verse. Psalm 37, verse 40 and notice this, notice what's going to happen for the one, for those who trust in God, who remember, put their trust in him. Look what it says, Psalm 37 and verse 40, and the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them. Now stop there for a moment. The Lord's going to help them. The Lord's going to deliver them. The Lord's going to save them. Why? Why is he going to do that? Because they trust in him. They put their confidence in God Almighty. The one who made the heaven and the earth and God is not going to let them down. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Remember the language of Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6? You remember in Psalm 56 and verse 3? Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Now that's going to be a lot of times as we go through life. Because there is that fear, there are those anxieties, there is that affliction. But the psalmist said, whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. In Psalm 62 and verse 8, trust in the Lord at all times. You just can't get around that verse. Well, well Ken, you mean when everything's going good? No. Uh, you, you mean when I agree with what the Lord teaches? No. Trust in the Lord at all times when things aren't going too good. When you don't know why really God has commanded you through his word to do something. Example, love your enemies. Human nature says, I, I just don't know about that one, Lord. Everything else makes a lot of sense to me, but love my enemies? Do good to those who despitefully use me? Really? Yes, really. Trust in the Lord at all times. Listen to Psalm 118, verses 8 and 9. Remember what we said about the help of man? It's useless. Well, here's sort of the background for this verse. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Think about that. Again, Hebrew parallelism. It's better to trust. Trust, what does that mean? Confidence. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Better to trust in him than to put confidence in princes. Again, so that trust, that confidence, that's what we're talking about. The book of Psalms inspires that. You read it and you're refreshed. You read it and you're revived. You read it and you're ready to go out even though you've suffered some affliction even though you've had those anxieties. Again, but you know that there's comfort, there's help. And as we're noticing now, we know that we can trust in God. You remember 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 9? God, I mean, Paul had that great affliction. It was a, a suffering, it was a death sentence, as he calls it. But he experienced it so that he could learn not to trust in himself, but in God who raises the dead. Now, who are you going to trust in yourself? Well, the trust, the confidence that you put in yourself, it's useless. Why? Because the help of man is useless. But the trust, the confidence you place in God, this is the one that created the heavens and the earth. This is the one that raises the dead. There's no one with this power. 
And all that power is at our disposal as his children. He loves us. He cares about us. I've been young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. Psalm 37 and verse 25. That speaks of all of these things we talked about this morning. That comfort, that help, that trust. Friend, what about it today in your life? We're talking about things of eternal value. And we're talking about things that I need desperately, that you need desperately. And they're only found in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're going to notice tonight the last point we make is going to be that the book of Psalms is love because of the Christ it foretells. You see, this book has a prophetic tone to it. It introduces us long before Jesus comes to earth and tabernacles in the flesh. It introduces us through prophetic language to this coming Messiah, this Savior, and oh, how we need him. All of us have sinned. We've all come short of God's glory, Romans 3 and verse 23. We're in desperate need of a Savior. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ is. There's salvation in none other. Acts 4 and verse 12. Call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Matthew 1 and verse 21. That can happen today. If you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, then friend, you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Again, you're still in sin and sin separates you from God. God doesn't want that. The Lord came to alleviate that problem. The Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost, Luke 19 and verse 10. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. So when we hear the good news, what we need to do is unite it with faith. Put our faith and our confidence and trust in it. Again, repent of that sin that separates us from God. Confess Christ as Lord. Again, be baptized into Christ for the remission of sin and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Read the language of Acts 2 and verse 38. And notice what happened for those who were being saved daily. They were added to the church. That's what can happen to that blood-bought institution, to the church that Jesus purchased with his blood, Acts 20 and verse 28. You can be a part of that, and thankfully so. The decision's yours. Nobody can make it for you. God's not going to force you to become his child. We will not force you to do anything. We're simply preaching the word that you need to obey, that I need to obey. All of us do. If that's what you want to do this morning, won't you come while we stand together as we sing?